As we begin our worship today, let us quiet our hearts to receive our Lord. worship at Sharp Memorial United Methodist Church on this beautiful spring day Sorry. in Young Harris, Georgia. Sorry, I think you dropped this. I want to do that too. Hey, I knew it's worth the start. Sally, I haven't been able to get a haircut in over two months. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to look my best. I mean, here we are taping, it's going out to the world, and I just wanted to look my best. And no doubt you were inspired by Dr. Burke. Well, I hadn't thought about that, but maybe yes. Yeah, the scarves. Yeah. Pam, do you really think God cares what we look like? You know, Sally, I have been for years telling my choir and sharp tones and any group that sings when they agonize over what to wear, how to look for a particular event, that it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you wear or what you look like. God's just happy you're here. Thanks, Sally. I really needed that. Okay, good. Thanks. Where was I? Um, oh, yes, welcome. Uh, we'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who may be joining our service for the first time. We hope you will join us again in the coming weeks, and we really look forward to the time when we can all gather in our beautiful sanctuary. We do have two announcements. Both are very good news. First, we have a brand new website. Check us out on sharpumc.org to see our new look and to find out more about us. And if that's not enough, we're also now on TV. You can view our worship services on Ridgeline TV channel 99 on Windstream Cable. And now as we prepare our hearts for worship, let us pray. Gracious God, we give
gather in your presence today as family. Bless us as we meet as brothers and sisters in Christ, accepting the responsibility this places upon us to love one another as you have loved us. Bless us as we seek to be your lights in this dark world. We pray that through our words and our lives, others might be drawn into your family and accept you as their Savior and Lord. Bless us as we meet together today, dear Lord, we pray. Amen. Good morning again. And if you have your hymnals at home or if you looked it up on Google, it's 322 in our United Methodist hymnal. Up from the grave he arose, we'll sing all three verses of number 322. So let's stand and sing. <laughs>
Um, Jackie, Angela, thank you so much. That was really beautiful. Thank you for coming out and being with us today and, and offering uh, our worshipers that wonderful. I, you know, that's a, that's a message we need to hear over and over and over again, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here today and uh, worshiping with us as we uh, have now just, uh, figured out that this is our eighth Sunday to be doing this. And so I want to uh, uh, encourage you, as we've been talking about the last several Sundays, uh, that we're still celebrating Easter. Up from the grave he arose. You know, that might have been a song or a hymn that you only sang uh, during the, on the Easter Sunday or maybe just the Sunday after. But we're continuing to celebrate Easter the power of resurrection, to be an Easter people. And so I hope that as I have uh, suggested that you continue to read the, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, we're going to still be focusing on the end of the Gospel of John, chapters 20 and 21. I hope that you'll read not just the Easter day, but the resurrection stories and how powerful they are that this loving God comes to meet us in our time of need. And today we're going to hear about how that uh, God comes to uh, one named Thomas in his time of need. So hear the scripture today, the Gospel of John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, pause the video and, and go get your Bibles. <clears throat> and we'll be reading from uh, John chapter 20, beginning with uh, verse 19. When it was evening on that day. Now this is what this is Easter day and this is now the evening of that. So we know that uh, uh, the, the women have gone to the tomb. They've uh, discovered the tomb is empty. They've run back to the disciples. They said, you know, that we've seen the Lord and uh, now it's evening. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, so this is now one week after that Easter Sunday, a week later, his disciples again were in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that through believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You know, it's that Easter evening. Things haven't gone so well on this Easter morning, remember? Uh, the women find the tomb empty. They still look around and look for Jesus' body. They decide to run and, and tell them. And at least for one, they say, I've seen the Lord. Mary announced to them. Um, but the disciples don't believe Mary. And now they've gathered in the house in the Easter e that first Easter evening. And Jesus appears among them. You know, have you ever been in that place where you were the first to experience something 
And, 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 and you go and say, man, you should have been there. That was great. That was awesome. You know, that, you be, that people have experienced something for the first time. And I imagine for Mary, it was for her. But now the community is kind of gathered together. The gang has gotten together and they're behind the locked doors. And Jesus appears to them. And can you imagine the jubilation? Can you imagine just the, the, the peace of mind, the joy that has come to them? And uh, because, you know, hey, we shared this together. We, we got this common experience that unites us, that, that uh, connects people. You know, that's what happens when you've got common experiences. And when you have some amazing and awesome experiences, <clears throat> well, that really just unites and connects us all the more. Have you ever had some of those? Maybe you think back in uh, your younger years and, and the group of y'all that went to Six Flags and, and y'all did the roller coaster ride together and you get off and go, wow, wasn't that awesome and that was great. Or maybe you got around that, I remember that one that just spun you around and around and around and around and you got off and you kind of wondered how that we were going to stand up. And, but you, you, you shared that experience together. You had stories about other people who might have gotten sick on the ride or something. But you, it was an awesome uniting kind of experience. You get connected because you had that shared experience. I remember going to rock concerts together. And, you know, the next day we said, man, you sound like Donald Duck. And. Yeah, it was a common experience that, that our ears were shot and we couldn't hear right anymore. But it was that joy of knowing that we had shared this together. Maybe you climbed a mountain together with family. Maybe you went on a 60-mile bike ride in the mountains and you survived going downhill at 40 miles an hour. Maybe you were together with a group and y'all watched the sunset off the beautiful mountains in this area. Maybe you were going on a mission trip together. It wasn't too long ago. I was a missions pastor and became a world traveler. And uh, we went to all sorts of places in the world. Uh, went to Guatemala and went to uh, El Salvador and went to Brazil and went to uh, Kiev, Ukraine and went to Liberia and Mozambique. And we, we went to a lot of different places and, and we took a lot of different trips there. We took several trips to each of those locations. I was amazed how people would say, man, that was awesome. And that was so spiritually renewing. God was in that place. And they shared it as if the people who had gone to the other places, that, that maybe that wasn't as big a deal. And yeah, it wasn't because it wasn't their experience. But, but to the group that went to El Salvador instead of Guatemala, that that was a, a, a common experience. It was a uniting experience. It was a connecting experience because in the midst of wherever there was, God was there and made that a special time. There was one time that uh, we were gonna be continuing to make trips to Liberia. And, but this time, instead of going all the way through Amsterdam and other ways, we were gonna go direct flight to Nigeria. Uh, Delta had just started going there. And uh, some of our Delta friends were telling us how, you know, they were escorted off by, with shotguns and they were escorted to the hotel. And there was just a lot of fear about, you know, is it safe for us now to go to uh, Laos, uh, Nigeria? Uh, the other way felt uh, safer. I don't know why, but, you know, in this direct flight. So I had to call some people that had made uh, ministries to in the midst of Nigeria. They were from Indiana, and so I, I called them up and I said, you know, I understand you've been going to Nigeria for a while and just wanted to call and ask how safe it was. And they said, man, we've been doing this for years. We go right in and they, the people welcome us and take us into the uh, areas of uh, northern Nigeria and, and we, we feel fine. He asked me then, he said, well, where is it that y'all are going? And he said, well, we're, we're turning back to Liberia. And he looks, he, he, he almost through the telephone, you can see this shock and horror. He said, you're going to Liberia? It's funny how that, you know, here I was developing this fear of Nigeria, and he already had that fear of Liberia, and yet we've already been eight times to Liberia, and we knew that was safe. Isn't it interesting how that sometimes we capture this this feeling of fear before we have a sense of peace about something. 
And it is interesting how that finally the group comes together and experiences together and be able to share with others this peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Well, I tell you all that to tell you about how it is that Thomas missed out on the trip. Thomas missed out on that first Sunday. Thomas wasn't there. Whatever it was and why he missed, we, we are not sure. But the verse very clearly says Thomas was not with them when Jesus came. And so there was peace that was missing. There was Thomas that had missed that first meeting. And so for him, there was not yet a peace of heart. We can maybe relate, maybe a missing person or um, a missing piece of the puzzle. If you put some puzzles together and you've got a piece that's missing. For Thomas, there, there wasn't a piece of, of heart because he missed. He missed that experience. But you know what? There's also not a piece of heart because Thomas was missed in the community. Maybe you've uh, have those memories where a friend's not in the picture, a friend's not at a party, or maybe a loved one didn't make the reunion, and you kind of have this sense of emptiness. Yeah, we had a good time, but it'd have been great if you'd been there. It'd have been wonderful if you'd have made it. It'd have made it that much better. And I believe that the community of faith in that first gathering, they all looked at each other and said, you know what, we've seen the Lord. And they shared that with Thomas. And it meant something to them, but it still didn't mean something to Thomas. He didn't experience that. That wasn't his experience. But I'm grateful that the community of faith reached out to Thomas and said, you got to be with us next time when we gather. And so sure enough, Thomas is there, it says. Thomas is referred to as this doubting Thomas. And and maybe it isn't that Jesus, that, that Thomas doubts Jesus as much as he doubts his friends. That can happen sometimes, you know. Or maybe Thomas needed more time to grieve. You know, we're all different with that. We're not ready to get out in public and whatever when we have, you know, had an experience like what they just went through. And really, does it even matter why Thomas missed that first meeting? What's really important is that the community of faith reached out to him <clears throat> and to welcome him back. A week later, Thomas shows up because they have said to him, we've seen the Lord. It was the same message that Mary gave those other disciples, and they didn't quite believe it either. And, and so now the disciples give it to Thomas. But Jesus comes in into the midst. And after saying, peace be with you again. As the community of faith is gathered together, he's pronounced his peace. Jesus then speaks to Thomas. I kind of wonder sometimes how people, when they come to church and they hear a message, how that Jesus might be speaking directly to them. And this is one time when Jesus reached out to one that was really in need. Jesus reached out to Thomas because he, he had a need for himself, but he also had a need for the community. When I think about the church, I think about it as a large mosaic. It's got a lot of little bitty pieces, and in some ways those pieces are insignificant as a mosaic might be. I've even seen one mosaic. It was a, a church pictorial directory, and every little picture of the members of the church were put together in such a way they formed the face of Jesus. Well, that was kind of neat. And it also is a reality that when you and I are brought together and we form this large mosaic of the face of God, isn't it really insignificant then that how we would want to even compare or judge one another? Because it took each and every one of us to form that picture. It took each and every one of us. And so who would question the importance of any of those pieces. The community without Thomas would just not be the same. And Thomas needed the community and the community need Thomas. The, the word church is ekklesia in Greek. And it means called out. That there is some inside work and some outside work of the community of faith. 
And one of those tasks we talk about, it's all through scripture, is the idea of hospitality. It's deeply embedded in the teachings of the Christian tradition, a sense of hospitality. Why? Because we need to have that sense of, of understanding the vulnerability of the stranger in the community. Wow. This is my first time here. Maybe you remember what it's like, or, or maybe that's what's keeping you away because, you know, it's, it's awkward to be going to do something for the first time. But a community of faith is going to show signs of hospitality to the strangers and make them feel welcome. The other thing that a community needs to be aware of is the dangers of exclusion. You see, Thomas got left out. For whatever reason, Thomas wasn't there. He didn't get the message. He didn't get the memo. Maybe Thomas forgot. But nonetheless, Thomas maybe wasn't ready. But the church had to be ready. And the church reached out to Thomas. It, it's almost like that the church, who we are as a community of faith, need to be in the perpetual state of inviting and welcoming. And they welcomed Thomas back. The church, I think, also needs to recognize the significance that God is present in the breaking of bread. That when we share in the cup and share in the breaking of bread, that God's presence is there in a special way. And we learned, we talked about that last Sunday in the end of the Luke, uh, Luke's gospel, where there are two disciples, two followers of Jesus who, who think that it's finished and over with. And yet when they sit down with Jesus, he's made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And what do they do as they have gone off and seen the Lord for themselves? They run back to the community of faith. They run seven miles back to the church, to the other disciples, to let them know um, that they too have a need for the community of faith. It, it's like, tell me the stories of Jesus. I need to hear them again. And we need to be the community of faith to go and tell the stories of Jesus, the stories of faith. So you and I, we live in within the community and we have that task to do. But it's also that we're supposed to live beyond the community. And, and that group got together that Easter evening, that first one. Thomas wasn't there and there were others that weren't there. And, and so they did their work together and they were... They were changed. Jesus came among them and they had a wonderful experience, but they weren't going to keep the experience to themselves. And so that work that's within is important and that work that lives beyond the uh, into the larger community of faith, because we may never know week to week whose life is going to be transformed by the risen Lord, that his presence there, wherever they're sitting or whether they're viewing right there in their living room and they begin to feel the presence of God in such a way they say themselves like Thomas said my Lord and my God when you read all the scriptures you recognize that that's one of the most profound confessions of faith in all the gospels and how important that is my Lord and my God Thomas said and you and I say, our God and our Lord and Savior. And then we even go further to say, your God and your Savior. And for wherever you are in your walk of faith, and maybe you've never even started that journey, it begins with knowing that Jesus is Lord and our God. And that Jesus comes to meet us where we are, no matter where that is. Even if we have the, the doubts of Thomas in, in his friends or the, the doubts maybe that Thomas even had of, of grieving and he wasn't finished yet. But he comes to this place and Jesus meets him there. What a powerful experience that was. I know that Thomas shared with others, my Lord and my God. May that be an experience for you. And that you would want to share within the community of faith and even beyond the community of faith. And how significant that is. To tell the stories of Jesus. Not only that you and I get to hear them together, but that you and I would go and tell them to others. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Today is the first Sunday as you, we are celebrating together, the first Sunday of May. And it's a Sunday in which we usually have communion. And since we can't gather together and be present with the, uh, the body of Christ in the, in the cup and in the, in the, in the bread, uh, we're going to practice a love feast. So, love feast. So, if you want to stop the video and get something to drink, something to eat, I'm going to get mine. So, we're not practicing Holy Communion just yet, but we will when the family gets back together. So, here we are together with something to eat and something to drink, and knowing that as we've gathered together. All are invited, all are welcomed, all are loved, and each life is special. So I hope that you will join me and take and eat and know that we do this together in love. The stories of Jesus. To tell them over and over and over again to remind us Jim, you are loved. Jackie, Tom, you are loved. You are welcome here. Angela, you are precious in God's sight. Sally, Pam, yes, yes, you. You are loved. And I want you to know that as we share this love feast together of Something to eat and something to drink. That Sharp Memorial as a church loves you. And we've got work to do. Because the world needs to hear that you're loved. But maybe even before that, we want you to know that you're invited. You're welcomed. You're important here. And God's love will bind our hearts together as we gather together and as we scatter in God's world. Peace be with you. Amen.